Welcome to the 2017 Virtual Summer School Series webinar sponsored by the NAE PSDP and the Program and Staff Development Committee of the Southern Region Program Leadership Network and hosted here at the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. I'm Julie Robinson with the Arkansas Extension Service and also the co-chair of the Programs Committee for NAE PSDP. To, in today's webinar, we've got Dr. Nick Furman joining us. Nick is an associate professor and graduate coordinator in the Department of Agricultural Leadership, Education and Communication at the University of Georgia. Nick received his bachelor's and master's of science degrees in forestry from Virginia Tech and his PhD in agricultural education and communication with a focus in environmental education program evaluation from the University of Florida. Also known as Ranger Nick, he teaches graduate courses in educational program development and data analysis and undergraduate courses in environmental education and teaching methods. His life's passion is teaching and he often uses live animals such as snakes, turtles, and owls to keep things interesting in the classroom. And he also uses those on his monthly television series in Georgia, Ranger Nick. Nick is gonna be sharing with us uh, what can be published, turning the non-publishable into publishable and empowering us to share our data-based extension story. So Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Love it, beautiful. Well, good afternoon again, everybody. I, I, as Julie shared, I love teaching and I wish that I could see all of you in person right now, but I'm just gonna be imagining what you're doing there in front of your computer as you're listening to me, hopefully laughing along, taking some notes. And I hope that you feel empowered today when we get done after the next hour together, empowered to share a data-based extension story and, and data, this word data, I hope is something that I'm gonna change your mind about, that data is not just always numbers, but it's a way that we can share a story and a story sometimes that, that has an, an unknown ending. I'm gonna talk about that today. So Julie, I really appreciate that warm welcome that you gave me. I wanna jump right into this and, and share a little bit about me because my passion for evaluation, I do love owls, I love nature, and I love teaching with animals, um, began at a very early age. Um, I'm originally from Maryland. I grew up in Perry Hall, Maryland. And as an eight-year-old, I remember sitting on a carpet square in my elementary school and a guy by the name of Ranger Bill visited our classroom that day and he brought with him a snake and a turtle and an owl and a hawk and all these different animals that were ambassadors of the message that he was sharing. And I remember after that hour-long interaction with this guy, I was forever changed. I went home and I told my parents about this gentleman that visited my class. I was amazed at how he edutained us, how he was not only sharing information, but doing it in a humorous and, and entertaining way. That was a one hour long interaction I had with that person. And I think so many of you are having that one hour long interaction with an audience and you know there's something that's changed about that audience, that group of 4-Hers that you've taught, but you need a way to collect some of that data. And then once you've got it, to share some of that information. Well, after I saw Ranger Bill at our school, I, I told my parents about him. And I will tell you, I kind of became a groupie of Ranger Bill. We would follow where Ranger Bill was going around Maryland and the Mid-Atlantic and bringing the animals. And the Maryland State Fair came about this time of year at the end of the summer in Maryland. I was nine at the time. And my parents and I walked up to Ranger Bill and, and they said, look, you know, our son cannot stop talking about what you did that day in his class, how you were teaching with animals. Well, to make a long story short, I ended up volunteering, cleaning a lot of cages for Ranger Bill. Let me tell you, animals are pretty dirty things, but that's a good thing. So I had a lot of experience cleaning cages and shadowing Ranger Bill until I became 16 and I could drive my own vehicle. I had this old Chevy Blazer and Ranger Bill said, Nick, you've got to be 18 years old to drive a state vehicle, but we can let you drive your own vehicle, put some animals in the back, in cages, of course, and go around and do some teaching with these animals yourself. Now, I couldn't go to a high school as a 16-year-old and teach. The students there were older than I was. They wouldn't listen to me. But I could go to an elementary school. I could go to a camp, and I could do some teaching there. And y'all, I did that. I did that from when I was 16 to when I was 22. And I traveled around the Mid-Atlantic and gave hundreds and hundreds of presentations with these animals. Never once did anyone ever ask the question, so what? Did anybody learn anything? 
Is anybody more likely to not throw that banana peel out their window when they're driving down the road because mice come to eat that and then owls and hawks come to eat the mice and they get hit by cars? I didn't know the difference that I was making, but it inspired me to want to get into this world of evaluation and determine the difference that my teaching was making, determine the difference that our teaching and extension makes. That led me to Virginia Tech and the University of Florida and then eventually here to the University of Georgia. I've been here nine years and I love evaluation because it's a topic I know that most people are walking into going, ah, this is going to be all about statistics and I don't do numbers and I'm not going to get it. So I'm going to close off right now. But evaluation is so cool. And then this world of evaluation and sharing what we get from evaluation is where we're going today. Let me tell you something. I'm going to ask you in a second what comes to mind when you think about evaluation. But I will tell you, for me, evaluation isn't about proving anything. It's not about proving anything. It's about improving what we do. I want to tell you that evaluation is about this process of collecting data to make decisions. Data is information that helps us make decisions. But if we don't share that information and it sits in that metal filing cabinet, just collects dust in there, no one will ever know what you learned from your data. And so that's really the topic of where we're going today, the power of evaluation, the power of sharing where we're going. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk about something that we are all doing on a yearly basis, I think, and that is writing impact statements. And I, I know someone shared the idea of impact. We're going to talk about how impact statements relate to the idea of writing for publication, what that means, and kind of take something we're familiar with and lead it into something maybe we're not as familiar with. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about my five-step process. This is like you're at a special inside meeting here. The five secret steps to sharing that database story in a publication. And I hope that I can change your mind today, that this is easier than you think. And it's something that we ought to be thinking about in, in the context of our job on a daily basis. Because if, if we can't share it, well, then nobody's going to know it. So let me tell you, I love Seinfeld. I was so sad when that show went off the air and I continue to watch the reruns of it. I love this picture of Jerry Seinfeld here because it seems to me when I watch him and I look at what he's doing in this picture, it kind of looks like he's saying, so what? So what? So you did all this great stuff, but what difference or what impact or what outcome came from all that effort, all that grant money, all that time, all those volunteers, all those nights sleeping in that cabinet camp with those crazy kids. What happened because you did that? And I love that picture, Jerry. And I hope that you can put that in your mind as you're thinking about publishing. I want to tell you that impact statements, as I think you're probably well aware, help us do really three things. They help us document a situation. We go out there and we engage in some kind of a needs assessment, or maybe you've got some needs assessment data that's been shared by a, a state specialist in your state, that you're acquiring that information and using that to talk to your readers, whether it's a legislator or one of your stakeholders in your county, using that information to say, here's why I'm here. Here's the issue or the problem that I'm dealing with, at least in this next year helps us communicate a situation. Second, it helps us communicate what we did about that in the context of that logic model that our friends up there in Wisconsin developed for us, that beautiful logic model, I use it all the time, helps us think about the inputs, the things that you invested to push that situation, not knock it down, but to push it. So that idea of those inputs. And then finally, as we know, impact statements, hopefully, or getting at some kind of a result, some kind of a difference that was made in the form of an output or in the form of an outcome. I think about outputs and I think about outputs being things that I can count and usually begins with number of. So I think about number of brochures that were handed out at that county 4-H extension booth, number of volunteers that were trained, number of hours that those volunteers were trained for, number of participants that participated in that safety training that we did. Outputs are really great things, number of. But it's kind of getting back to Jerry's picture there. You know, you tell me, Ranger Nick, I handed out 1,600 brochures at that county booth at the fair, but then I'm going to say, okay, great, but how many of them ended up in the trash can? How many of them were actually read and somebody used the stuff that they read from that brochure to change their life, to make a difference in their life? Of those average of 60 people that participated in those trainings, how many of those people stayed awake 
and use that information you shared with them to go do something different in their life. That's the bridge between outputs and outcomes. And that's such a special thing. And that's where we're going to go today. So I want to start off with step number one. We're going to walk you through the five steps today, range the next five steps. And we're going to take a couple of commercial breaks as we go along, just to kind of keep everybody engaged with me. And that's where I'm going to use. I got a couple of critters sitting here next to me. They're not loose in the room or anything. They're sitting right here very quietly with their legs crossed. I'm just kidding. They're both in their little enclosures. I'm going to take them out and show them to you here in a couple minutes as we do a couple of commercial breaks. I love to integrate the animals in as an analogy to what we're talking about, and so I'll do that in a couple. Here's step one. You know, I, I used to be a huge fan and still am of the Franklin Covey method. I used to walk around with a paper calendar, and I still do. I'm on my cell phone calendar now, that Outlook thing, but you know, this group Franklin Covey always said, begin with the end in mind. And I want to start today with step number one, tip number one, and that is start with the end in mind. Begin that year, begin that way you're looking at that plan of work with what could I possibly share from the efforts that I'm going to do this next year and start thinking about it at the start of the year. You know, so often evaluation is an afterthought. And being an evaluation guy, I'll tell you, often folks come to me at the last minute and they go, oh my gosh, Nick. I got this grant proposal that's due tomorrow, and we got to put an evaluation part. Can you write something real quick? Sometimes that should be the, the thought at the beginning. You know, begin with the end in mind. So I want to encourage you all to think about beginning with the end in mind. What part of that plan of work could you possibly share in a publication? And early in the year, could you get your university's institutional review board, that IRB office, could you get them in the loop? By all means, reach out to them and ask them, hey, is what I'm doing in collecting this data okay? It's better to get that permission there than to ask for forgiveness later. Make sure that you're getting that permission to collect data. If you're collecting data and just sharing it internally, we don't need any IRB stuff. But if we're going to share it in a peer-reviewed kind of a publication, yeah, we got to get the Institutional Review Board involved. And I work a lot with our specialists here in helping them through that process. Just some hoops you got to jump through to make sure you're not asking your participants anything too strange. And I'm sure none of you all are, but that's just one of those things we have to do. I'll also share with you this. If you have some data that you collected a few years ago that you said, you know, that Ranger Nick guy inspired me to open that filing cabinet back up and get that data back out, that data although you didn't intend to pub publish it at the time, you can call that archival data and reach out to your IRB, explain to them how you collected it and get that permission on the back end. So don't think that because you've got some data that's a couple years old, if it's still relevant, don't think that you can't share it. You sure can. Just keep your IRB, your institutional review board office, keep them in the loop on what's going on there. And then I tell you, once you get that IRB approval, you get the green flag to move forward with that stuff and actually share it, think about where is that story going to land? You know, I'm a big Joe Journal of Extension fan. Talk about a great wide reaching audience that thing goes to. So many of my grad students, man, they can do a Google search, go right into Joe. You get all kinds of great, great stories, I call them stories, articles out of there that are peer reviewed, that are valid and great to share. You're going to get a lot of exposure that way. And I tell you, if you're sharing something in Joe or in the Journal of Human Sciences and Extension, I guarantee your administrators are going to be impressed with that. I know here in Georgia, we're really encouraging our extension professionals to share what they're doing. And I tell you what, it was mentioned earlier in the text box, and I'll say it again in a couple minutes, even if you have information that you're surprised by, that you said, I didn't expect this to happen from the information I got, that's important to share too. So step number one, begin with the end in mind. Think about where that story is going to land and keep that IRB office in the loop so you don't get your hand slapped just in case. All right. Step number two, I'll tell you a little story with this one too. But I got to tell you, if step one is start with the end in mind, step two has got to be this idea that, you know what, we're going to change the way we think about evaluation. We are going to celebrate evaluation. We're going to think about evaluation not just as a pre-post test, pre-post questionnaire that we give out at the start and at the end of that activity. We're going to think creatively. And I want you to harness creativity in evaluation techniques. I got to tell you, so often we learn about a situation in your county because of a needs assessment. And we go right to the, the needs of your county, the needs of your region. What we often don't do, and I try to encourage folks to do this, 
is to share how you know it's a situation. That's what makes extension so great. We're data-based. We're research-based. We're a land-grant university. We ought to not only be talking about what we know, the pictures, I always use that analogy, the pictures we've taken, but let's brag about the camera that we're using. Talk about how you know it's a situation. That's what sets research base apart. Now, to tell you a little story about getting creative with evaluation, we do talk a lot about that in Georgia and, and changing mindsets about what data is. Y'all, pre-post tests are great things. It tells us about change. It tells us about where someone started and where they are after we're done with them. Great stuff. But often, it's not exactly the most enjoyable thing for participants to do. No matter how energetic or excited you are about evaluation, they're going, ah, here's that evaluation I knew was coming. So there is this zoo in Atlanta. You know, we're about an hour and a half east of Atlanta. And there's this large zoo in Atlanta. I'm not going to mention the name, but it's a big zoo in Atlanta. Zoo in Atlanta. I right? won't say the name. But they're great friends of mine that work out there. And I do a lot of work in environmental education with zoos and aquariums. They approached me a couple of years ago and I said, Nick, they said, we've got this Zoomobile thing that we've been doing for a couple of years where we take some animals in a van and we take them out to different libraries and community events and we teach with these animals to put on about a 40 minute long presentation. And then we leave. And as part of this grant that we've got this money for to support this activity, uh, we have been collecting evaluation data. And Nick, I'm looking at the data. This is what the director told me. I'm looking at the data and we are not making a bit of difference. We are not doing anything with this activity. And I don't know what's wrong. I don't know if it's the educator that's teaching. I don't know if it's the animals. I don't know if it's the audience. Can you help us? So I said, all right. I said, let me take a look at your camera. And by that, I mean, let me look at the tool that you're using to collect that data with. Y'all, you got to excuse the y'all thing. I'm from Maryland, but I tell you, the Georgian that y'all will get used to it here. Y'all, I tell you, I asked, can I look at the camera? Can I see what you've been using to collect the data with? This survey that they were using, a questionnaire, paper-based questionnaire, was seven pages long. It would have taken twice as long to complete the questionnaire as the 40-minute session lasted. And I had to be careful with how I, you know, because you can't look at it and go, well, gosh, what were you thinking? You know, you got to, okay, well, this is, a, this is a great questionnaire. But this questionnaire would be more appropriate after this audience went through a whole summer, a whole summer's worth of activities with you. The bar is set so high with this questionnaire. And I actually went to one of the activities they presented. Nobody had anything to write with. Nobody had anything to write on. So I'm watching people, hey, you lean on my back and I'll lean on yours and complete this. And it was a mess. So you can imagine the quality of data that they got because of that. Had an excellent activity, had data that said nothing's going on. The camera that they were using, it was like the lens cap wasn't even removed. <laughs> they weren't getting anything. It was like somebody just smudged the lens. So I said, we need to clean this lens. We need a new camera to think about data. So I put a little red carpet on the screen there and I'll tell you what we did. We did some red carpet interviews. I said to the director and she looked at me first like I was crazy, which people often do. You may be doing that too, right now. She, I said, Stacy, I said, I want you to see if you can get me a, a long red carpet. I want you to get me a couple iPads and we'll put them on a tripod to do some videos. And I want you to get me some little plastic microphones, just kind of pretend microphones. And the lights like they have on picture day at school, like the big bright lights with the umbrella over them, get me two of those. So get me a couple of bright lights, a red carpet, a little camera, and a, and a microphone. So we got these things. And as people were coming into the activity, the zoo educator invited some folks over and asked them one question interviewed them on camera, but what people were really excited to, to sit there with the microphone, talk into the camera, and, and say their answer to the one question that was asked. Then they went inside. They did their 40-minute long presentation, and as folks were coming back out, folks were lined up to want to talk on the camera in the red car. They were excited, excited to talk into that microphone and share their answer to another question. So we had a pre-question, one question, presentation, and a post-question. Very simple, but very realistic. One question. 
that was able to tell me, and this was the funnest part, I got to watch all the videos of all the people one by one talking into that camera, sharing their response to the question before the presentation and after. The difference in their response from before the presentation to after, incredible. It showed that in reality, they got something out of this. that changed their mindset about snakes. They think differently about native wildlife to Georgia, and they can't realistically do something in their backyard to help animals. It was incredible. And we were excited to get that data, and folks were excited to share it. Can you imagine? Think differently about data. Now, along that same line, this leads us to our first commercial break. So we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to tell you, I love teaching with animals, and I have to say, you all can't see this on camera, but I have my laptop here I'm teaching on, and the IT people at the University of Georgia have gotten a, a call or two from me because, well, when, when you teach with animals, you know, I, I can't tell the animal that you can't go to the bathroom, and, you know, I've got this keyboard right in front of me. So I've had to call the IT people before and say, well, you're not going to believe this, but I got... Uh, I got some animal pee down in the keyboard again. And I mean, it's just, who else? Oh, Ranger Dick, it's no problem. So I want to talk about an animal I brought with me that as you think about taking more than one picture, more than one source of data that you're bragging about in that impact statement, maybe you're bragging and sharing about in your publication. Just the same way we try to triangulate information, one source and another source and compare them, just like when I go to the dentist and I get a second, a third, and a fourth opinion before they take my wisdom teeth out, you triangulate that data. I want to show you a little animal that on its back is kind of a way of triangulating, kind of a way of sharing. Let me show you my little buddy here. That's my little friend. You know what's so funny? On the back of their, on the back of their shell, look at this little fella. Oh, now that is, that is an adorable. Look at the face. Isn't that cute? Y'all, this is a gorgeous... Eastern box turtle, and his name is Scooter, just like the scoots on the back of his, look at him. I don't want to get too close, so give me a kiss. But little Scooter, Scooter's about seven years old. Scooter's an Eastern box turtle. Y'all, these are all over from Mississippi East, here in the East. Eastern box turtles are, are kind of threatened here. So often they're hit by cars, lawn mowers are not exactly their friends. And I tell you, so often people find these guys near their homes and they see the same turtle, what they think is the same turtle over and over, and they decide to paint their initials on the back of their shell in nail polish, hot pink, hot green. Imagine what that does to the camouflage. That ruins that camouflage and then a fox or a raccoon comes along and, and has a meal. Box turtles are such a wonderful little turtle out there. And of course they call them box turtles, not because when you find them, you put them in a box, but because when they get scared and Scooter is not at all scared, he joins me on TV and stuff sometimes. Scooter's not at all scared. When they get scared, they usually tuck in their shell and they fold up just like you would fold up all the sides of a box. They do that same thing there. So Scooter's pretty, pretty cool little fellow, but Scooter's shell is made up of 13 scoots, 13 blocks that together describe his shell. I want you to think about that when you think about evaluation and sharing your story. Put multiple scoots, put multiple sources together and talk about the shell. Don't just talk about one scoot, talk about the whole shell and share that message with your audience. Isn't that a neat thing? He's pretty cute and we didn't have any accidents today. So the paper towels, I'm going to get them out of here and keep on going. Isn't that neat? Eastern box are beautiful, beautiful little guy. I'll tell you, he's in captivity with me because one of the 4-H centers in Georgia um, donated him to me when he was just hatched. They hatched him at a 4-H center. He was the size of a quarter. So in seven years, you see how big he's got. Pretty cool. But turtles in their shell, a lot in common with evaluation. Putting our story together, multiple sources as we share that. So a quick commercial break there. Back at number three. Here's step number three. So you start with the end in mind. You talk about harnessing creativity with evaluation. Hopefully I've inspired you with that type of data. Third, you think about what we've all always been doing, and that's our impact statement, sharing our story with our constituents. But what I'm thinking is work smarter, not harder. Let's align our impact statement with your publication plans. Let's think about that situation being the needs assessment, maybe being that literature review that you would share at the start of that publication, bringing your reader up to speed saying, hey, the sun will not rise tomorrow unless we tackle this situation. That's how I think about situations. I convey them in a way 
that it justifies my existence. This is why I'm here doing extension. This situation's important. And if we weren't here dealing with it, there'd be an even bigger problem. So the idea of the situation is so important. So begin sharing your situation and not only the situation, but remember talk about the camera that you use to take those pictures. Brag about the situation and how you know. All right, so the situation is one. Second, talk about how you responded. Talk about not only those outputs that we saw in that list a couple minutes ago, but talk about your inputs. Talk about those volunteers that were involved. Talk about that grant money that you got. Talk about that in your story, in your publication. That's part of your methods. A lot of people think about that's part of how you got that program or activity off the ground. You're doing it in your impact statement with a response. Transfer that over into your publication. Okay, working smarter, not harder. And then finally, oh, this is the you know, meat of the thing right here. And those are the results and those are the outcomes. And that's the, hey, just like Jerry Seinfeld, so what? So you've got all this great data or these plans to collect data, which is okay to share too. And you got to tell your readers, so what? How did the information that you collected or plan to collect, how is that going to push that situation? And I tell you, I mentioned in a couple slides ago, the Journal of Extension, there is a little piece there called Ideas at Work in the Journal of Extension. That's a place for you to share your story, and maybe you don't have the ending of the story written yet, but maybe you've got some plans for the future, that's the place to share that. Talk about your situation, talk about what you've done so far, maybe a creative thing you've done to collect data, but then say, here's what we intend to do in the future. Pretty cool thing. Now, I've got a little house there on the screen, and I love to use acronyms and analogies with animals when I teach. If at the very least it just amuses me, I hope it amuses other people out there. They, they laugh along with my students do. I think they laugh at me more than they do with me, but that's okay. I got their attention. I got that picture of that house on there. When I think about outcomes, I often tell our folks in Georgia and my students to, to talk about your house. And I'm not very good on multi different languages. I can barely speak English myself, but I hear that in Spanish, a house is referred to as a casa. But that's spelled C-A-S-A. I've never been very good at spelling, so I spell it K-A-S-A. -A, and by that, I mean K for knowledge. What knowledge was gained because of your teaching and your program? Okay. First A, what attitudes maybe were changed or impacted because of your teaching? S, what skills were imparted in that audience because of your teaching? And then the final A in KASA, the, the final A, we talk about aspirations, intentions that your audience has because of what you've taught them, K-A-S-A. -A. So when you're talking to a buddy about evaluation and sharing your story, I want you to say to them, hey, keep it in the house, K-A-S-A, -A. knowledge, attitudes, skills, aspirations, four key things to think about in the world of outcomes. So it's good stuff right there. So. With that being said, we mentioned it a little while ago in the text box that y'all were sharing. Here's step number four, recommend suggestions for others. And here's the thing. I am a pretty positive guy. I don't know if you get that impression here. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I rarely have a bad day. I can look at stuff and go, hey, you know what? There's something good. There's a silver lining in everything. And I take that stance because in the world of publishing, in the world of collecting data, it's never going to be perfect. Y'all, we are measuring people. People are hard to measure. So there's always going to be some limitation. There's always going to be some hole. There's always going to be some extraneous factor that we talk about in the, in the world of research that could potentially impact the results that we're measuring. And that's okay. Sometimes when we implement a new evaluation technique or we try something in a pilot program and certain things went really, really well and certain things didn't, we think that we've, we've been a failure. Well, now what? Well, nothing worked out. Well, now what am I going to do? How do I get anything out of this? Sometimes those are the best stories. Those are the best impact statements. Those are the best publications are the ones where you not only talk about your successes, but your setbacks. We tried this and here's what happened and it didn't work. So we're going to make some recommendations, some suggestions for others so that if you're trying this in Texas or California or Alaska, you learn from that guy in Georgia, oh, don't do it that way. He tried it and he ran into some roadblocks. What an important message to share. I, I sometimes believe that it's more important to share what didn't work than it is to share what did work. 
So think about that. Think about that as you're changing your mindset about sharing data and about publishing, even about impact statements. Don't think that sharing what didn't work is always going to get you in trouble. It's important to share. That's the, that's the point of sharing. Sharing rhymes with caring. You care about other people, and you don't want them to make that same mistake that you made. So, and if you, I, I make a lot more mistakes sometimes than I have successes, so this is a really good thing. I, I share a lot of setbacks, but I always say you're not trying hard enough if you haven't failed. So I, I try awful hard on a lot of things in teaching, and sometimes it just doesn't work, and that's okay. I, I'm still in the process of sharing my story about the red carpet interview. I want to get that out in the Journal of Extension because I had some folks share with me say, Nick, that is a really neat story, and, and it is inspiring me to think differently about data. And I hope it did for you today, too. Our fifth step as we march toward the end and a second commercial break coming up in just a second, our fifth step is the idea of empowering a friend, a colleague, or two or three to help you. You know, so often in extension, we talk, at least in Georgia, about doing more with less. How are we going to recruit more volunteers to help us? How are we going to get these folks in? Because I'm one agent that covers three counties. How are we going to do this? How are we going to retain that person and get them knowing that we care about them? We're going to encourage them to collaborate. We're going to encourage them to get another colleague or a or graduate student or a stakeholder involved um, in helping them share their story. I've got some friends of mine that are working in Extension that have partnered up with some classroom teachers. A 4-H agent and a classroom teacher or two have gotten together, classroom teachers working on a master's degree, learning about publishing, learning about doing some things through a thesis. They said, I'm going I'm to share this story. So they've been working with me to share what they're doing in, in, that's working with kids in a school garden. What a neat thing. They've gotten together with some colleagues and some friends, and they're trying to work smarter, not harder, getting together with those folks. Find folks that you enjoy working with. Find folks that you enjoy writing pieces with tell you there's no sense in trying to do this alone. It's hard when you're sitting in that extension office and the phone's ringing and folks are coming by with soil samples and, hey, what kind of snake is this? And you know how it is. I want you to, to reach out to some friends to help you with some of that. At the very least, it can help you with proofreading. I love that little sign right there. I stole that from the internet. I wish I had seen that because I, I would I would have taken the sign. All others will be toad. I like toads too, but that's that's a great one right there. Get a friend or colleague to help you. So this leads us up to our final animal analogy, our final commercial break before we bring some closure to this today. I don't want to keep you any more than an hour. I appreciate you all hanging in there with us today. Got to tell you, this next critter that I've got, this second one, is one that is really, really good at change. And I love the expression, and in fact, uh, Kathy Dempsey in a, in a book she wrote, wrote about shedding or you're going to die, shed or you're dead. The importance of changing, change is hard, but it's important to get others around you to help. You know, I've been talking about doing something that relates a lot to impact statements, but it's still all gonna be difficult to get you to sit down and say, all right, I'm gonna look up those submission guidelines for Journal of Extension. I'm gonna print them off and I'm gonna start with an empty Word document, as scary as that is, I know, and we're going to start thinking about writing about what we're doing. And we're going to take a chance. We're not going to think, oh, there's no way this is going to get accepted. We're going to say, no, we're going to write this up. We're going to get together with some colleagues. We're going to send it off. We're going to see what happens. At the very least, maybe we'll put it in an impact statement. So it's hard to get that train rolling. It's hard to get those wheels turning, but once they get going, once you get those colleagues together, you're thinking differently about data, it's easy to keep that train moving. And it's a pretty cool thing when you get together with your friends to do some of this. Remember, impact statements you're already doing. I've got a friend that I'm going to share with you that's really good at changing. In fact, this friend I'm going to share with you, and I will stop sharing my screen so you can see her up close. Sometimes this friend is, is often discriminated against. Sometimes she is, uh, she's called bad words. Sometimes people throw things at her. Sometimes people try to kill her. I'm going to show her to you. I think she's adorable. I thought Scooter was really, really cute. I'm going to show you Sandy. I think Sandy is super cute. I know as crazy as that sounds, I think she's super cute. I'm going to show her to you. Bring her over to the camera. I'm going to reach, and, and I, tell, I tell you, y'all, I'm glad y'all are at a distance because I, I have this bag. I have this bag that this animal is inside of, and I brought... Well, I'm just going to tell you, I brought two baby rattlers, and both of them, both of the baby rattlers got out. Do you see them? Both of the baby rattlers got 
Yeah, that's how it goes sometimes here in Georgia. Everybody just rolls their eyes. Oh my God, Furman again is like, no, I'm serious. I don't, I don't have baby rattlers. They don't pay me enough to work with non venomous snakes. I got a non venomous one. I'm gonna share with. You. I do have a little snake. I'm gonna share with you. Just a heads up. Her name is Sandy. I'm gonna take her out of the bag here. Sandy is great at changing. Let me talk about Sandy and how important it is to kind of be like Sandy when you're thinking about changing and you're thinking about sharing. Let me show you her face. Oh, she's adorable. She's in a bag right here. It's what we use pillowcases for in our house. Is transporting snakes. Oh my gosh, look, look at the face. Look at the face. I mean, y'all, she, now for our friends out west, she is a, come here, sweetie. She is a western hog nose. Look at the face, hog nose snake. Her little nose is turned up like a hog's nose. See, like razor back, right? Arkansas, right? She, it's turned up, like, look at that. She is adorable. Look at that tongue going, tasting the air. Beautiful. She's full grown. Sandy is full grown. Sandy actually came to me from Wisconsin. They flew her to me overnight, got her to use in my teaching. She's a sweetheart. Hog nose snakes are called that because of their little turned up nose. And here's what's so special about hog nose. When a hog nose snake gets scared, they want nothing to do with folks. The last thing they want to do is to be around a person, even though Sandy likes being all ranger neck. If they get scared, the first thing they do is they take that little tail, which I even think is cute, look at that little tail, and they vibrate it against the ground to sound like a rattlesnake. That doesn't work. They hiss really loud, and they puff up their skin around their neck and actually look like a cobra. They will rear up like a cobra to try to scare what's in front of them away. If all that doesn't work, if the vibrating the tail, if the hissing, if the standing up like a cobra doesn't work, coolest thing, they will roll over on their back and play dead. And she's done it before. She's rolled over on her back and I flipped her back over and nope, she's rolled back. And, nope, I'm dead. I'm dead, dad. I'm dead. Leave me alone. Tongues hanging out. Incredible. Snake wants nothing to do with folks. This is one that what a wonderful example. It's a Western hog nose. Our friends out West have got these such a beauty. And she comes into my classes with me. Y'all, what's so neat about snakes is they're very good at changing. They're very good at responding to change. And I tell you, here at Georgia, one of the classes I do, just to let you know, helps students overcome public speaking anxiety. You would not believe football players holding Sandy, standing up in front of an audience, teaching. They've told me they feel less nervous holding Sandy than they did without her. And that's kind of crazy, but they say she takes the attention off of that. She puts the attention onto herself and makes that speaker feel better. I love using animals when it comes to speaking. And Sandy doesn't live in this bag. She just travels like that. You know, earlier today I was in a meeting and the duffel bag I keep her in was moving around. People were wondering. I wonder what's in Ranger Nick's duffel bag over there. <laughs> so there you have it. It was Sandy. So we'll get back to that. Isn't that neat? Shed or you're dead. Change is hard. We've got to do it. Y'all, we're going to wrap some things up here today with you. And, and I want to recap where we've been together. We started with this idea of starting with the end in mind, beginning with the end in mind, thinking about where you want to publish that stuff. Journal of Extension, Journal of Human Sciences and Extension. Where is that story going to land? Do I need to get IRB involved? Second, we talked about harnessing creativity. Man, it's not always about pre-post tests. Sometimes it's about getting creative with how we collect information. Gosh, we've even used drawings here in Georgia, pre-post drawings that tell us what someone has gained from an activity, what's in their drawing before versus what's in their drawing afterwards. And we've scored those. We're thinking differently about evaluation and then we're thinking differently about how to share that. Pretty cool thing. Third, we talked about, hey, thinking about what you're already doing, aligning your impact statement with your publication plans, where that's gonna go, situation, response, results. Talked about that. Talked about getting somebody out there to make some recommendations for you and to help others when things don't go right. And then finally, we talked about not doing it alone. We talk about not analyzing data alone, not writing data alone. Do it with somebody else. Get some friends involved so it's at least a little bit more fun for you. Now, I always need a lot of help remembering things in a particular order. So if you've been playing along, the importance of empowering you to share is right there on the screen. There's the five things we talk about, spelling out, share, to help you remember that. And I hope that you've been, you've been empowered today to think about sharing that message. Y'all, 
I, I encourage you to reach out to me there at my email there, Ranger Nick at Furman at UGA.edu, and I'm on Facebook. I, I reach out to some of our friends that watch our Crazy Ranger Nick series. It's on YouTube. So if y'all want to keep in touch over Facebook, you can watch some of the craziness that is that show. I'm the same way in class as I am on here as I am on TV. I love teaching and I love empowering folks to think about things differently, whether it's nature, whether it's data, whether it's publishing. And so it's a lot of fun to be with you today. And I've been envisioning all of you out there all over the country. And I really just appreciate the invitation. And it's so neat to be able to look through this little camera on my screen and think that I'm talking to you all out there. And hopefully you've, you've laughed along and you've said, hey, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. Ranger Nick, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try to share this story. And I hope it's helped you today. So thank you all so much. All right. Thank you, Nick, for sharing with us today. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us for the 2017 virtual summer.